Welcome to the Linux Spotlight. This show is dedicated to showing off the best thing about Linux, our community. This community is made up of developers, distro maintainers, YouTubers, and everyday users. Each one plays a vital role in our community. And the goal is to have a discussion with each individual about their journey into Linux and beyond. So join me now as we turn the spotlight on. Hello, I'm your host Rocco, and with me today, our special guest is Carl Rochelle. Carl, how are you? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Rocco. Well, I get to talk to you about Linux today, and it's a Friday, so that's a plus, brother. <laughs> <laughs> and later today, I am taking my kids up to Breckenridge for skiing, so uh, I am doubly excited. Nice. I love it. Yeah. All right. You are the CEO and founder of System76, which is, everybody knows, is a manufacturer of Linux-based laptops, desktops, servers, and, of course, the infamous Pop! OS. Right. All of that is what people will be familiar with and know you by. But if you were to meet somebody that you didn't know and you were going to try to describe yourself, what would you say? Oh, wow. <laughs> that is a tougher question than I expected right out of the gate. <laughs> well, I, I think I would say that I am um, infinitely curious. Uh, the thing I, I just, I, the thing I love most is learning and that's what's so so fantastic about being an entrepreneur and about being part of a business and around an incredibly smart group of people is that there is always something new to learn and, and, and more things to explore and more things to build and try and do. And um, so uh, I think I'm first and foremost, just, just curious to all ends. Awesome. So, you know, being a CEO of your company, it's an extreme amount of work. There's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears involved. I don't know how you find time to do everything that's needed for your business. Um, do you have any other hobbies? You know, you mentioned skiing. Uh, do you have any other hobbies outside of the computer Linux realm? Yeah, well, I love, I love skiing. It's, um, uh, I take my kids up. It's the season, so every weekend we go up now, and um, uh, my, my kids are in something called Breck Bombers, and so they go into their class, and then, I go with my friends and I actually snowboard and, and uh, they're learning to ski. So uh, that's a big part of our lives in the winter. Um, I love fiction. Uh, some years ago, I, when I was younger, I always read um, uh, technical books or, or history or philosophy or things like that. I was, uh, you know, I was working on my career. And so, uh, so I read um, a lot about um, the, the things that apply to the work I was doing. But then somewhere around 25 or 26 or so, um, I started reading the Time 100 Best English Novels. And um, it's just this fantastic list where you just can pick one and you can't go wrong. Right. And my wife and I would read them together and um, I fell in love with fiction. So ever since then, I've just been you know, seeking the, you know, the, best, the best books out there and um, reading. Do you have a favorite one? You know, actually, the way uh, I think about it a little different, I don't have necessarily a, a favorite book. What I have are um, favorite things about books. Okay. So um, my favorite ending is The White Zaragoza Sea. The ending is, is just, it grabs you emotionally. It's an incredible ending. My favorite um, climax is, uh, is John Updike's Ender's Run. Or not Ender's Run, sorry. <laughs> John Updike's uh, Rabbit Run. Um, the climax is. It was. I recall reading it sitting sitting on my couch with my wife, and she was doing something else, and and I knew what was going to happen at the climax, and everyone reading it knows, but doesn't want what's going to happen to happen, and does. And I set the book down. I said, like, "You want to go down to the diner down the street? And maybe." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just one of those ripping books. It's. Uh, John Updike's a fantastic author. It's uh, I, I read um, Dickens, uh, you know, earlier, earlier, and and Dickens very uh, he used lots of words and very very detailed, and you can draw very precise pictures from his writing. John Updike can take what would be four or five pages of Dickens, and he can do the same thing in a paragraph. It's um, just incredible. 
Good incredible yes. author. They books and movies together have that way of making you know bringing out the emotions uh, yeah. for those types of things, and it's. I mean, I'm not a big book reader anymore. I used to read books all the time years ago. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they definitely have a way of bringing them emotions up to the top. Yeah. Right now I'm reading Echopraxia, which is the second book. Oh, I love sci-fi as well. Um, it's such a convenient place and time because you can ask all sorts of interesting questions when you're in the future, right? And certain limitations we have now don't exist. But uh, Echopraxia is by Tom Watts, and it's part of the Firefall series it starts with uh, blind sight and these books are absolutely fantastic they're you they're hard to put down they're there's i guess they're they're page turners right uh, right um but if you're into sci-fi read tom watts um uh firefall series it's amazing well you mentioned sci-fi and you know i know that uh, there's a lot of people involved in linux well it's a common thread to be uh, a fan of sci-fi and be in Linux. It just happens that way. Yeah. Are you a uh, are you into like a Star Wars or Star Trek type thing or what? Yeah, more of a Star Trek type. I really enjoy. I'm actually watching Star Trek: The Next Generation again right now with my son. <laughs> <clears throat> my son's six, and these the stories are so fantastic. What I what I really love about it is that we're watching it together, and now he's at the age where he's um, where they set up a they set up a plot, and it's basically a mystery, and um, so throughout it, he's asking me questions about, and, and we're starting, we're thinking about what, what might be, what's happening here? What's the story, you know, underneath, the, uh, underneath what's happening. And so it's become uh, one of our nightly routines to, to watch an episode. Well, I was never good at it, but it always, it always was fun to try to guess what was going to happen next. But, you yeah. know, I just, I never picked the right ending. I think it's just the watching your kids think and how they think is so. Uh, fascinating, wonderful experience. And so I get to see it in a very, uh, uh, you know, very satisfying way watching that. And I mean, these, what, I mean there's episodes are, you know, one episode is about what is death and the very next episode is what is life. And these are, these are <laughs> deep questions yep. <laughs> that they don't necessarily answer, but that's what they're about. And so. Yeah. Deep questions uh, and, and a lot of wide ranging topics on them. So. Right. Yeah. Well, speaking of deep questions, um, you do so much that's open to everybody. Uh, every You're in the public eye. And I think we could all sit back and armchair quarterback any decision that you make or System76 make. But making decisions for your company is more than just making a decision. It's for your employees. It's for customers. It's for the community. And can you talk a little bit about how you approach that and how you view your position and that responsibility? Yeah, well, um, the, the good thing is I've been doing it for such a long time that uh, the decision making is a little less difficult than it once was. Um, uh, now we have a large customer base that we we lean on um, understanding what our customers' challenges are and um, and talking to them about how well our products are working for them and what things we could be doing better and. And then we invest in those areas. We survey all of our customers um, after we've sent them a product um, to ask them, um, uh, you know, what, what if they have any feedback, um, whether they would recommend us to uh, a friend. And um, and our customers are very forthcoming about um, their their impressions of our product. So we collect all that data. Um, I believe Linux was, or, or Emma was on the show <laughs> not mm -hmm. too long ago. Um, Emma actually collates all of that information and, and puts it in a, into a format that we can all digest and then make engineering and investment decisions based, uh, based from. So, yeah. uh, so the combination of uh, having done this for quite some time and having a, a, you know, a vocal and, and considerable customer base helps us, helps to make it easier to make decisions. Um, things, even things like building a factory was, it always felt obvious because those surveys were coming back and there were things that we just could not accomplish with our design manufacturers and or to or to make those improvements would take too long. And we felt that we weren't serving our customers well enough. And we knew that, you know, we may not as a small company be able to plug ourselves into this massive, you know, uh, supply chain in, in China, but 
this this can't be that hard, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so we went ahead and built a factory, and since launching Thaleo, it has three, four hundred um, improvements to it. Because yeah. now we're, we treat hardware just like software now. You get software updates on Pop. Um, although hardware is physical and it stops at that time, um, the product as it ships from us is better weekly, eventually daily. It's um, you can always make something better and never be satisfied. So, um, so uh, now we're now we feel a lot better about our ability to build the things that are are uh, you know, the best possible products for our customers. Right. Well, we're going to get into uh, System Seventy Six and what you guys are offering. But before we do, I'd like to go back to the beginning of your computer era. What was the first computer that you used? Oh, you know, I think of it a little different because it wasn't actually a computer. It was a typewriter. <laughs> but hey. it was a typewriter that you could program. So uh, my dad is, uh, owned a construction business, and so he needed to invoice his customers, and he was doing it, uh, you know, all on paper and, you know, the typical way that you did this, these things in the late 80s. And um, so, uh, so I convinced them, I think at Sam's Club or something like that, to buy this typewriter where I could program um, forms into it, essentially. And so I programmed his invoice and, uh, you know, his invoice forms and his quote forms and things like that. And he could go out and he could fill them in and, and had a much you know, more professional presentation. So that was my first bit of, 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 kind of interacting with an electronic device. Bit. Well, you had to be kind of technically savvy in order to even have that idea and start that, right? Uh, I suppose um, I don't know, from... Part of that is well. One, I was just it was always fascinated with fascinated with computers and and technology, and uh, to this day still am. The uh, uh, I think the difference is putting together what um, they can do for some. And at that time, my my grandfather was an entrepreneur, and my my dad was as well. And so, uh, growing up, I sat around the table at Christmas and listen to their stories with the, the problems and the good things and the bad things and all. what you know what it was like being a business owner and so i, I think i learned a lot just just um, spectating for quite some time right. and then um, started seeing the uh, you know seeing the inefficiencies or the things that could be better and and uh, and what better way than to use a computer to <laughs> to solve those problems it's when you get to do it once and hopefully uh, uh, it's reusable yep well that was you said back in the 80s um yeah. so when do you come across linux like do you come across linux when it first came out or is that years later uh it's probably i think it was pretty close when it first came out um uh for some reason it's fuzzy <laughs> <laughs> uh, I really, so red hat linux was the first one that uh, i i used and um uh it was it was frustrating for me because I was all I needed was for my nick to work <laughs> and, or my, and I think it was dial up at this time and so I was you know going to micro center and you know buying every nick they had it had a tux logo on the side of it and I would put it in and the, so for a long time my Linux machine was just for playing chess because <laughs> I couldn't get online so I couldn't just get further into it and being online was is you know an absolute a necessary component to just to learning and exploring what Linux was. It's how it was developed, or how it is developed, and um, so so yeah. I started out with Red Hat Linux and my uh, my expensive chess machine, <laughs> and then uh, and then tried Susie and a number of others. Eventually got things working and and dove in all the way. So do you? switch to Linux right away or do you stay with Windows? Um, uh, at that time I was using both. Um, for work I was using Windows, at home I was using Linux. Um, I was working for Lucent Technologies, so um, I was a consultant for, for Lucent and I did um, programming of PBXs, which are phone systems for businesses. So uh, all the tools from Lucent were at that time built on, um, built for Windows. But some of the tools were Unix, so I enjoyed working on those. They had something called a, uh, 
gosh, I can't remember the name. <laughs> uh, it was this, uh, uh, it was it was a voicemail system that you could do anything with. It was the kind of thing where uh, when you called in, you would, you would get a menu and that menu could, um, uh, could then do a screen pop for agents. And so they know who's calling so they could more quickly uh, service you and all those type of things. And, um, Intuity Audix, that was it. It was Intuity Audix, and that was Unix based, which I read. I loved that because then it, it felt felt new and fresh. Um, one of the uh, one of the funny early stories is when in elementary school we had to write our hero. Okay. I wrote Steve Jobs. Of course, <laughs> I never got a letter back, but that's who I, that's who I wrote in elementary school. And then, I believe it was ninety four or ninety five. It's when Windows 95 was coming out, and I was 14 or 15 years old, and I was very concerned about the monopoly of Microsoft. <laughs> I, thought <it> was, <laughs> I thought it was a danger to computer science in the future, and uh, I was really concerned about it. And so I wrote a letter to IBM's CEO saying, hey, you should really... <laughs> <laughs> you should really compete with this uh, instead of just uh, instead of just you know uh, gathering you it up. You can't let Microsoft do this. <laughs> yeah, you can't let them do it. Uh, so that that was uh, yeah. I, I think those uh, somehow looking back on it, it's it almost seems inevitable that a Linux OEM would be where I'd end up. Right. Well. Um... You stay. You you talked about uh, Red Hat, and then those were your early days. But in between the time, you know, obviously now we you guys develop Pop OS. But in between that time frame, what are you running as far as a Linux distribution? Um, it was mostly Red Hat um, uh, and OpenSUSE. I would switch back and forth between those. Um, uh, Debian for quite some time as well. Uh, but I didn't do a, a lot of distro surfing until much later, until like the uh, early 2000s. Okay. Um, I listened to an interview you did with Jason Evangelo when you had the uh, System76 event. And you did talk about this. So I don't want to like, you know, rehash the whole situation, but I would like to know how you started System76. How do you become, how do you go from becoming a regular Linux user to saying, hey, I'm going to build computers with Linux on them. Right. Well, um, it seemed to me at that time, this is 2004, that Linux had reached this point in which it was just a better product than what was available from Microsoft or Apple, but didn't have um, professional representation from, from a hardware uh, manufacturer. So it was, uh, you had a great piece of, a great operating system, a great software, and um, in no way to easily reach people without them having to take all of these extra steps to uh, to use it. Uh, I thought it was. I thought I think of a computer as kind of a, a holistic product, something that uh, the hardware and the software work together to provide the best experience. And while it's not, you know, completely necessary required, you can get a lot, um, a lot. You can build a better product when you're thinking of them together. And so I think um, that's what we identified was that um, this community is underserved uh, because there's not somebody that's thinking about them every day. And, right. so, and that's the reason that we started System 76. Do you remember your first sale? I do. Yes. Uh, it's less interesting than my second, but <laughs> less satisfying <laughs> than my second. The first thing the System 76 sold was a printer. <laughs> okay. Yeah. The theory was that uh, if this Linux thing was brand new to you, that you might be concerned about, um, is my printer going to work or is this peripheral going to work or these other things? And so we also offer the peripherals that you could feel confident in um, if you buy this and this, that, uh, or if you even have this, that it's going to work. Well, we sold the printer and it was to an a APO address, which is a military address. Um, these are things that I didn't know at the time or, or understand. So we shipped the printer out, and um, it's, you know, it's probably in the mail for a month, maybe a month and a half, and then finally the thing has traveled the world and it comes back in pieces. 
So the, the very first thing that we sold never reached its destination and came back in pieces. <laughs> never reached the customer. And also learned a valuable lesson. USPS does not pay insurance claims. <laughs> so, wow. Or it's difficult to get them paid. So, uh, so our first sale was a loss. <laughs> so the, the second you said was more interesting. So what was that? Well, maybe at least more satisfying. Okay. So, uh, the second sale was to a customer in Colorado when we were in Denver. So uh, that was uh, you know, pretty, uh, pretty exciting to get the, the first sale and it'd be a hometown customer. So we uh, got the laptop at this time. Um, we had no money and no engineering. It was me and a friend. And so we, uh, we did all the engineering, everything the moment we got the computer, uh, which because we didn't have enough money to like have stock of all of these things. Uh, it was really, it, I would never do it again that way. <laughs> it, was, it, was, it, was, uh, it was a lot of sleepless nights, but, um, but it, it worked, uh, you know, so, um, so we pulled everything together, got it going. And then, um, uh, and then I personally dropped the computer off at the customer's house because they were here locally. Oh, nice. And drove up there and I was expecting, I don't know what I was expecting, but I knocked on the door and the guy's like, oh, thanks. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Thanks. That's yeah. all. See you later. <laughs> There's another one that's like this, the story that I enjoy. Um, and uh, this is a, has been a customer who comes and visits us once or twice a year now. And he was one of our first customers who worked at Raytheon at the time. He's retired now. Um, he checked, uh, he was checking our products out and, uh, you know, he liked the website and the products. And then he goes and he looks at the address and it's a house. Not just a house, a duplex on a street off of Colfax in Denver, Colorado. <laughs> and, like, well, um, I find out later that he drove by and he's like, well, what? <laughs> this, is, this is the computer company, huh? I'm not <laughs> sure if I want to buy this or not now. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, and he ended up taking the leap of faith and buying anyway. And I drove, this is another one where I drove the computer to... Raytheon and I met him in the lobby and we chatted and I gave it to him and uh, now he's been he's been a friend ever since uh, and he's got to see us step by step. That's awesome. The, those are the folks, the people that took the leap of faith in us early are the reason that we're able to build all the things we can today. Yep. Agreed. So as the company grows, you start hiring people um, and you being the leader of the company, uh, you need to possess certain skills, you know, like wisdom and leadership and foresight. You got to build a team around you that, you know, follows your vision for the company itself. And from everything that I can see from the outside, you've assembled a great team around you. Uh, so what are the qualities that you look for in people in that environment? Well, um, you know, that's difficult. I think we, we've become better and better at hiring over time and, and, um, I think just practice makes perfect is the kind of thing. So it differs for different roles. Um, when it comes to engineering, we're, uh, you know, we're it's a little bit easier because we have um, they're just we we have code challenges for candidates that come on, um, you know come on the team, and um, so that kind of that weeds out folks pretty early because because of our depth of knowledge and understanding of the the Linux stack and the computers in general, we're able to construct a challenge um, that means if you if you do it successfully and you and you stylistically look, it's correct the and, and looks looks good and you haven't done any weird weird things um, then we know that you're a good candidate to work here and then what we're doing is is working on, on uh, well you good personality fit so so then we bring people in we all go out to lunch together with the team the team that they're going to be working on uh, we just have a conversation we talk about Linux, we talk about what we're doing. If it's marketing, we talk about marketing and technique and, and uh, uh, distribution and all those type of things. If it's, uh, uh, if it's sales, we talk about customer relationships and managing accounts and what ways to do that. So in each of them, the conversations are different because they're different disciplines. But um, uh, I, I think just over time, we have a, a close-knit team that's a, a leadership team here uh, that we've all learned from each other and, and we've been around for a long time. And all you know, that together makes hiring a little, uh, a little more successful in adding to the team with good people. Right. Well, 
Now, you know, as the years go by, you've hired people, you have a line of computers now that the list is long. Um, you've got uh, the Galago Pro, the Darter Pro, the Gazelle, and, and I'm not going to list them all out. Um, do you have a favorite out of the laptops line that you add? I know that I'm not supposed to ask a question like that, but <laughs> I mean. I know, it's like, which, which, which baby is your favorite, right? Right, exactly. But the thing about computers is um, not every one of them is for everyone, which is why you need to have a lot of uh, variety. Um, I think it's, I think the same thing goes for operating systems. I, I, I love pop. I put my heart and soul into it, but I love Linux and Linux distributions in general. And so, um, and I, what I love about it is that there's variety. And if you're, if you're doing pen testing, there's one that the right distribution, because that's what they think about every day. If you're, uh, uh, so for computers, um, for, and laptops, if you're, if you're, if GPU compute and gaming matters to you, it's Oryx Adder Serval. Um, uh, if it if it's more casual gaming, then Gazelle works well. Or entry level um, GPU compute things, then the Gazelle is a perfect product for that. I love uh, I like portables, uh, ultra portables. I don't do a lot of CPU intensive things or graphic intensive things. I do all my gaming on a Switch or a PlayStation. <laughs> so, <laughs> so for me, the Galico or the Darter is perfect. Uh, I'm also uh, I also prefer not to have a 10 key numpad on my laptop. I, I like my keyboard more centered on the screen. And so that's why I lean towards the Galago. But I have a new favorite that isn't released yet. What? <laughs> and that, uh, that is coming sometime in March. Can you uh, give us any details? It is. Well, uh, I love ultra portables and, uh, this one is an absolute beauty with the battery life that you drool over. <laughs> that's wow. That's uh, what we're we're working on now. And the other side benefit of it. So um, I actually don't change my lap my computers very often. My laptops, desktops. Um, uh, I just I was on a Galago two, and I just switched to a Galago four. Um, and the, my primary reason for doing so was because open firmware. Uh, it is um, just something special to knowing that the stack that's booting up your computer is open source, uh, just like the operating system running on top. But there's another piece that's not open source yet, and that's the embedded controller firmware. And um, to me, to my mind, the embedded controller firmware is more important even than the system firmware. Because embedded controller controls everything like your keyboard, your hotkeys, uh, your battery, your um, uh, your how your display operates. Um, uh, the embed controller is basically the brains of the components attached to the computer. And with this new system, it will be our first one that also features open source embedded controller firmware. So nice. Um, and uh, once that's released, it'll roll out to others as well, to other models. Well, well, I'm not sure exactly how many, but it'll say, I know the Galago because I'm using it now on the Galago and the Darter. But suffice to say, uh, I'm very excited about uh, both the uh, the form factor, the design, the the specs, and this this uh, embedded open EC uh, framework. Right. Well, you recently announced that you were going to manufacture your own laptops, yes. and I know this has been an area of criticism in the past from people. Uh, this is, I mean, it's not a simple thing to just say, "Hey, we're going to manufacture laptops." Yeah. Um, what led to that decision to say, this is what we want to, this is where we want to go. Well, it started um, uh, with the same things that the, the challenges and the reasons that we did desktop. We started with desktop because it's, um, it's just an easier form factor to work with. It's a smaller portion of our business. So we could cut our teeth on something less risky to us overall. Um, so uh, we learned how to manufacture with desktop and we did, we did that for the same reason we're doing laptop and that, um, that, we're, we're a smaller company and it's, it's hard to get everything you want from ODMs that depend on huge customers like Dell and HP and others. So, so what we're doing is negotiating with other regions in the world, um, like Europe and South America and Asia uh, for, um, you know, 
describing here's the things that we would we want and we're lobbying for the things that we want and they're lobbying for the things that they want and you know sometimes we can come together and so we we share we share models so that we can produce enough at a, at a good price uh, right but in in the end we're not getting exactly we know our customers best we're not getting you know exactly the thing that we would build knowing our customers so um because that's why we're we're investing in manufacturers so we're we're pretty confident that we can build something special. So can you give us any details on what your thoughts are on like your laptops that you're going to manufacture? Are you making a whole line of laptops like you have now, or are you going to start out maybe with, you know, uh, just for power users, just for portability, like you mentioned earlier? Yeah, we'll start out with portability and we'll start out with just a couple of models. Um, I doubt we'll do anything with NVIDIA to start. Um, it just multiplies the complexity considerably, and so and we have very close relationships with Intel from the firmware team and the, uh, and others, so that we can uh, so we can get the support we need to produce boards and other things. So um, so yeah, uh, ultra portable with Intel graphics is where we'll, we'll be starting, and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, any plans on uh, maybe an AMD laptop? Uh, not yet. Um, I do love what AMD is doing. Uh, it's interesting. On, I would like them to move more towards open source on the CPU side. Uh, Intel is making a push heavily towards that, and uh, they're open sourcing a lot of their firmware. We're working with them on that. And it's, um, this is a you know, fantastic trend. Um, AMD on the GPU side is open source and far better than dealing with proprietary modules uh, from NVIDIA. So. Um, so if AMD can move their their firmware and their um, that that side more towards open source, um, then then we'd have really a really solid platform over there. So we'll see. I'm very interested in it, but uh, I, but I don't know. So. All right. Well, let's go into back into I should say the desktop. You offer uh, the Thelio, and you offer three different models of this. Um, what do you consider sets apart that Thelio model from other desktops? Hey, well, um, one thing that we're able to do because we're designing all of the components along with the thermal and cooling system is that we can make a much more compact system um, with a, a large amount of performance. Or um, comparatively, the performance for volume is much higher in Thelio than it is in other systems. So um, uh, the base Thelio system uh, can support a 2080 Ti graphics card. For instance, but it's only a foot tall, right? Uh, and um, and the I think one of the cons the differences is that you can jam that into a smaller box, but what happens is you're going to start throttling the components, and then it didn't matter that you spent a thousand dollars on the GPU because you're only getting eight hundred dollars performance. But we're able to optimize the airflow. We're able to optimize. Um, uh, we we have more information in the operating system than the motherboard alone. Um, so, and we have a fan controller, the Thaleo IO board. Um, so we're able to take more information and with that information, um, build a more performance system. Uh, there's that. And then I also love the, the design touches and the things that, that we've done. Um, I think it's, a, it's just a beautiful piece of, uh, piece of machinery. And, um, uh, and on the back, the things like, we don't leave, leave anything on, undesigned i guess <laughs> uh, the, the back grill is uh it was, it was we were trying to figure out what to do with it we had we had all these different grills from different pcs and from over, you know, over time and we realized one of them was rings in a circle we realized you know that looks a lot like a solar system um we why don't we put a solar system on the back instead of just rings that's rings are boring well, let's make it more interesting and then, you know, if it's going to be the solar system, why not the solar system at the time of the Unix epoch? Let's have it. Let's make sure it has meaning. It's not just for design, but there's a purpose behind it. And um, yeah, those, those things I'm quite proud of. Well, I mean, speaking of that, you're the case, you know, you mentioned, you, you know, you got the mountain landscape on the side, you got the solar system, the Unix epoch on the back. Um, these things can seem small to people, you know, uh, oh, that's just a, a case, but, but that shows your passion 
for that you guys have for your company and for your brand. Can you speak a little bit about why it's important to you to put all of those small, minor details into it? Oh, uh, well, I think if you're not passionate about it, then what's it matter? <laughs> There's uh, that's we have the pleasure of coming to work each day and doing something that we love, that we care about, that we feel is making other people's lives better. And um, you know, what comes along with that is just a, a desire to do your best all the time and, and to not settle for the simple and the easy answer. We, you, know, you, you can't just put holes in the back if you want, and that, that would be fine. But, um, but what's special about that? What's unique? Why should anyone care if um, all you're doing is the easiest thing? Yep. Are you able to share anything you're working on for the next Delia? Um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, so I've been working on uh, thermal a lot to the last month or so. Uh, so in, uh, in the Thaleo line itself, some of the feedback we got with it, it was um, louder than people would have liked. And so it's interesting because as we were, we thought it was really quiet. Uh, but then we're working in a factory. <laughs> right. so, so there are, you know, there, there's noise around us. And so, uh, so it was something that we didn't identify uh, when, during our, our process of development. Um, so we built a sound room and it's this eight by eight cube that has, um, you know, sa- really thick drywall and sound deafening material and floating walls and, you know, everything that you need to, to remove vibration and, and sound from coming through the walls. Um, and then we painted it as a cube, so we painted it as a Rubik's cube. So it's pretty fun. To- <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So uh, so I spent a lot of time in the cube, <laughs> and uh, and so I took Thaleo in there and was listening to it. I thought, you know, they're right. This is uh, when you're in a quiet place. This is this is too loud. Um, so uh, so we started developing tools to um, uh, to modify and to understand what was happening and how how. Um, how we could improve it. And um, in the end, we were able to knock seven decibels off of Thaleo for almost all most workloads, which makes it nice. incredibly quiet. It's whisper quiet now. It's running it. Um, uh, a whisper is considered like 30 decibels. Mm-hmm. And we're at 32, 33 decibels. So it is, um, it is quiet. Uh, That's a big difference. Yeah, it's huge. And we've, uh, we also, um, uh, we also, we just got better at building fan curves. We just, it's, it takes a lot of patience and a lot of effort and time, but um, by just spending time on it, um, there's also some gut in it, unfortunately, um, but I think we have pretty good gut. <laughs> <laughs> there's little things like when your, uh, uh, our CPU coolers can be, work passively, uh, meaning they don't require any fan at all, so it's silent. Right. Um, uh, but on some processors, uh, the thermal load of the processors is a little too high for just the heat sink alone for much longer than, you know, a, a, a few minutes or something. So while you can turn the fans off all the way, um, every few minutes it might turn on a little bit. And that's actually a more annoying sound than just having them run at a very low speed. Yep. So those are all the, like, now we're, now we're doing, we're working on, finer points of what it feels like to own this sitting next to you. Um, and that's, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. It's, it's challenging work. I've been working on Thaleo Massive with, with four GPUs. CPUs comparatively were easy. Four GPUs. GPU cooling is very, very challenging. But um, I think that this, this, the way this work is going, um, we're going to be able to offer a computer that, can, um, that is beyond um, what's available anywhere else um, when it comes to, to maximizing and optimizing, maximizing the performance available from those GPUs. Um, I, I feel confident in that because I know, I now know how hard it is. Right. I mean, seeing how much work it takes. So those are, yeah, those are the things we're working on in Thaleo. Oh, uh, we're working, we're all working on, uh, we're also working on offering more color options. Oh, so, uh, nice. Yeah, I I think people will be pretty excited when they see what we're coming up with. I, I'm hoping we can do that in about a month. <laughs> awesome. I love it. Yeah. 
All right. Well, let's get into uh, Pop OS. So, you when you released Pop OS, there was a lot of criticism from the community, and you know it was just uh, we don't need another distro. It's just an Ubuntu. Fla- it's just an Ubuntu distro with a theme on top of it. But now, you know, obviously, time has proven that there is a lot more work on into it, and it is something that's not just a Ubuntu with a theme on top of it. What was it? Why was it important enough for you to decide to make your own distro? Well, it started when um, Canonical decided to pull back from from Unity and um, adopt uh, GNOME once again. So for some time, while well, well, Canonical worked on Unity 8, the um, uh, Unity 7 and the desktop was kind of in maintenance mode as, as it was going through release after release. And um, Unity 8 just felt like it was taking much, it was taking a long time for it to reach uh, reach the things that we care about, which is an operating system on laptops and desktops. And I don't, um, I, I think they should have taken the shot. They, they went for it and that, that's fantastic. Um, you, 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 have to, um, you have to take risks. I liked the strategy and, um, and I wish it had worked out, actually. I, I would have loved to see a Unity, a really solid one of Unity 8 DE on, on, uh, on Ubuntu. Yep. But um, unfortunately it didn't. So, um, and and we also knew that uh, you know the cloud was a really strong point for Canonical, and that's where um, uh, that's where they're leading. Uh, they're an industry leader, and so it made sense to me to, for them to double down in the place that they're doing best and uh, pull back a, a bit on the, on the desktop. But for us, the desktop is everything that we do. Uh, it's um, it's everything uh, that matters to our customers, and um, and we've also known over the years it's very similar to the reason we decided to build a factory. Um, over the years, we've just identified all of these things that are, were pain points for our customers when it came to um, uh, the distribution. And, and we wanted to take um, responsibility for those. And yep. that's, uh, that's why we built Pop! OS. Um, we, were, we were ready to invest in, uh, in building the product as we saw our customers needing it. Um, and a very early and easy example is that a lot of our customers request uh, or require full disk encryption. And um, we were, as an OEM, we weren't able to do full disk encryption with Ubuntu and Ubiquity um, uh, because uh, they had home encryption, uh, which the customers could set up, but not full disk encryption because if we had set the disk, the, the disk up um, fully encrypted from us as an OEM, we would have had to have the key to to sign the encryption setup. Yep. Um, so, so we built a new installer that encrypts the entire drive when the customer receives it with their own local key. Um, that's you know, one small example of something that for for quite some time we were we knew about and we we just we felt helpless. Now we don't feel that way at all. <laughs> we right. feel like if there's something um, that's a problem for our customers or we could do something to build a better product, um, we're able to do it. Well, Pop! OS is fantastic. It is my distro of choice, and I've been running it since uh, April of last year. Yeah. So I love pretty much everything about it. I mean, the passion that goes into it, the, the theming, the features, everything. Uh, there are so many things that set it apart uh, from other distros. And just the ISO itself, having two versions uh, with NVIDIA and Intel, is just one of those things. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about what you guys do to give back to the ecosystem through Pop! OS? Yeah. Well, um, so a lot of those things, we, we do a lot of work in hardware enablement. Um, and so obviously being an OEM, that's an important part for us. And so um, patches go up to the kernel to enable things like uh, uh, hotkeys or, or uh, uh, functionality for, for uh, Thread Over 3 or Ryzen 3 and so forth. Um, uh, a lot of our work for uh, uh, in uh, GNOME is kind of, I think we're starting to get to the point where um, uh, where we're going to be sending designs into the GNOME design team and saying, hey, we, this is what we're thinking uh, about and these are the reasons why and we're looking for feedback. And by the way, we're we'll, we also interested in doing the engineering for it. So for, for quite some time, um, the work has been around the edges. 
Mm -hmm. we, I feel like we're right at the time where it's going to start getting deeper. We built an installer and um, we think we identified a lot of problems in, in those installers and, and solved them there. Um, but then it's also always, it's up to others if they want to adopt the, the things that you build or not. I think it's fine either way. It's, I, I just, my, uh, I, I, my ethos is go out and, and build. And if it's <laughs> open source and people can use it, that's, that's wonderful. If it's useful just to your customers, that's great too. So, um, yep. uh, are, are you involved personally with the coding of Pop OS? Oh, uh, very, very little. Um, that's mostly the engineering team. Uh, by far, I'm, I'm nowhere near the engineer that they are. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I, I can do small things around the edges. They understand things at a level that is super incredible. Yep. So, I mean, I heard recently, I love the idea of this uh, i3-like extension yes. you're working on. Uh, can you give us your thoughts on on that maybe like why you would do that and maybe a sneak peek into what you're working on next with pop os right so we call it pop shell i don't know if it's the best name <laughs> but we call it and uh, i'm a huge fan of i3 and sway i love tiling window managers i, I like um uh, i like the way that they work and the user experience um, but there there are some things that make them a little hard to get into but once you once you start using them they're quite fantastic so we were on the edge of either um, do we offer a separate Sway or i3 session on POP or do we bring these hiring features to POP itself? Mm -hmm. And after having worked on Sway for three or four months, um, I thought the best route for us would be to bring some of those features to POP. So uh, the way that I think about these two distinct ways to use computers is that um, um, tiling like i3 and sways is uh, strict strict tiling the mm -hmm. what we're doing is a is a um, loose type of tiling where everything can tile but you can always grab it and pull it off um, you can uh, you can tile automatically by default um, or uh, or you can tile individual windows on their own so it's much looser than those and i think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of questions that we have that we haven't answered yet throughout the development process about how well um, uh, how well it's going to work, but I still have a, a pretty high degree of confidence that um, we're going to be able to create something pretty neat for our customers. I can't wait. I can't wait to try it. Um, you can try it now if you'd like. Uh, it's let's do it. Show me how. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, uh, go to GitHub.com/pop-os. Look for shell. Okay. Um, you can download and install shell and, um, you know, uh, I know Michael's the one that's, that's spearheading this right now in engineering and, um, pre right now he's working on, uh, the GUI ab ability to turn on auto tiling and things like that. Um, that's, it'll be much more approachable when that's, that's there. But if you want to, if you want to try it and use it, um, I'm using it now on all of my computers. Um, uh, it's in development, so there's lots of rough edges, but um, but it's pretty neat, and, and and just getting better every day. I don't know. I think I might want to do that. So <laughs> yeah, I, uh, and if uh, if you get in there and you, you start using it, we're looking for feedback too. Get into okay. pop chat and um, yeah, let us know what you uh, what your experience is with it. Awesome. I think for 2004, we are considering, and I think it's likely that we're going to do a beta release this time. That we haven't done before. Oh, really? Um, and the reason is because these changes are so transformative and so big mm -hmm. um, that we'd like more feedback. I think it'll be um, just within the community, so in, in the Pop Chat community. Um, but um, I'm just waiting for that point when. So the Flatpak support that we're doing um, and FlatHub, that's mm -hmm. essentially there. It's I think it's almost done. There's just a, a few things here or there to do. The tiling work is probably a month, a month and a half out. Um, so let's see, February, March. So I think early to mid March, I hope we can do a beta release where people can use this and we can get feedback on it. So we can, so we have a good month and a half to tighten everything up. Nice. I love it. Yeah. So um, just a minor question. 
what do you think is harder out of these three things? Building a company, building a successful computer line, or building an operating system to satisfy the Linux community? Oh boy, <laughs> it's very hard for me to separate those. It's hard for me to separate those because, okay, if I was building an ISO, uh, a operating system without an OEM, I think that would be really, really hard. I think being an OEM is what informs us um, and, and helps us build a good operating system. Um, oh, the answer has to be A and B. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, uh, it's, it's no, no small feat to build, a, uh, to build a, a successful company. And then when you're doing it in something like hardware, where there are these massive supply chains and there's uh, tight margins, uh, that just makes the first one harder. Right. So, so yeah, uh, uh, it's both are quite, quite challenging. Well, you, you've mentioned multiple times about uh, open source and open source software and how it's important to you. Are you in that realm of, I only use open source software or are you in that realm of, uh, I'll use the best tool for the job? Well, um, I think, uh, I do. I like to, I, I use the best tool for the job. So, um, I like my Roku box. I like my PlayStation. I like my switch. Uh, I prefer that they were open source, but they're not. And I'm kind of okay with that. I don't think that that's okay in computer science. I think, right. uh, and you know, I think on a long enough timeline that um, uh, that eventually all things will be open. I think it's just uh, it's just slowly pulling things away from the proprietary world. Um, it takes time, but in a place in which um, something like the computer, which is far too powerful, far too liberating to be proprietary, um, proprietary software has no place. It's um, uh, it's just it's it's a kind of thing where when you spread out the ability to do something, especially with something that's as versatile as a computer, um, it's just better for the world. Uh, right. If if fewer people understand how to make an operating system, it's just, and maybe this applies to everything. I think I think computers have just a lot of versatility, so I think of them less like a, a device, like one one you know one specialized thing um but i th that that same philosophy i'm sure actually applies to all other things so if you could change one thing about linux what would it be oh gosh there's so many good things um uh this is the one thing i would change i would um uh I think not in NIH, not invented here, is an absurd and toxic idea that has no place in open source. And um, so if there's one thing I would change, I would, uh, I would get rid of NIH. I, I, I'm on the side of just encouraging people to build and make things. And I don't care if you use my thing or not. I, I, want, I just, just go out there and make stuff. Uh, yep. Because you never know what happens uh, when, you, when you try. So. Um, that's that's what I change. Awesome. Uh, is there anything else you want to share with people? Gosh, I don't know. There's a lot more to come. <laughs> uh, we're just getting started, and uh, this is a really special time to be part of open source, and it's a special time. I think we all feel it here at System76. Um, really, uh, really exciting things are coming, and, and yeah, we're just getting started. Awesome. Well, Carl, I want to thank you for not just joining me today and talking to me, but for the passion that you have for Linux and the open source community and the the vision that you have, the, the example that you set as a leader in that community. Uh, I appreciate everything that you do. Okay, well, thank you. And it's the same to you. I, I love your the Linux Spotlight. It's a you know, fantastic program. It's, it's great to get to you know, kind of behind the curtain with folks. You do. You do an amazing job of it. All right. That's going to wrap it up. Thank you all for joining us this week as we spotlight the best thing about Linux, our community. 
Until next time, long live Linux.